Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Self-Published Success, a show that highlights forward-thinking authors who chose self-publishing over traditional and found success in doing so. My name is John Feldman, founder of Visionary Literary and your host for today's show. Our guest today is Sean Shuchuk. Sean is the number one results coach, the productivity speaker, two-time best-selling author, and the founder of Change Your Results, a high-performance coaching program. He is known as the productivity speaker and has made over 600 media appearances. Today, he's here to discuss how he brought his teachings into his book process and what you can learn from them. Sean, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. We appreciate you being here. And before we hit record, there was so much that you were telling me about with regard to your career. So what I just read off was extremely short. Can you tell us a little bit more about you and your background and what led you into want to do everything that you're doing? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I, uh, it doesn't seem like as long as it has been. So for about the past 28 years, I have the privilege to work with over 12,000. We're at 12, and I think maybe those numbers might be a little bit dated that you, that you shared. Um, because I think that even the media appearances were, were a little higher than that, maybe wow. higher than that. but anyway, wow. um, so that is, and then, you know, I've been privileged to speak all over us, Canada, some in Europe as well. Uh, but I think the biggest part of this is I was a coach before there was such a thing as coaching, uh, at least outside of sports. And that's, uh, you know, even to this day, it's still somewhat of an enigma to people. You know, if you walk down the street, major, any major city in and raise the top of of coaching you're very likely to meet with um you know in a short period of time a question of what sport so you know at the end of the day um what i do is a little bit different and a little bit more unique than what most do from a coaching perspective um there are a lot of modalities out there and there's lots of specialties out there and there's lots of coaches out there um and let's be clear there are some incredible amazing coaches and conversely perhaps there's some that could use some help but the point I, I make is this, um, each one typically specializes in a modality. So their sales coach, their marketing coach, their mindset coach, their, and, and, you know, this, the list goes on and on. Um, and I, I really do think that all of these are necessary. Um, but what I think some of the challenges, and I watch this and I hear it, we feedback where people have gone out and uh, hired a coach and they've done exactly what the coach has told them they should do. Excuse me, but the challenge that that happens is if, I'll give you an example. Let's say I hire a sales coach, and now I've learned how to sell and I've practiced it, and I'm and I'm good at sales. But if I don't have anyone to sell to, what good does it do me? Um, you know, we look at sales. Marketing is what brings people to your door, so to speak. Sales is what invites them in. But if I've got no one to invite in, and let's be very clear, I, I, I'm not going to sell anything. And every business is a sales organization. If you aren't selling, you aren't in business. So there needs to be, and, and the reason that I've been so blessed and to be as successful as I have been in our team over the past, you know, almost three decades, is it's a holistic process. It's not just sales and marketing and mindset and branding and all of these different things. It's all of them. Because I need to understand marketing and I need to understand sales. Because if I don't have marketing, I don't have clients. If I don't have clients, I can't sell to anybody. Therefore, I'm not in business. Uh, um, and then there's all the ancillary uh, aspects of this where we start talking about branding. Brand People say, well, brand is my business card and my letterhead. No, my logo. No. Um, you know, the brand is how people perceive you. It, the brand is what is going to drive traffic or people or questions or engagement. And so all of these different things, and that's the 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 difference um, you know, and th there's different aspects and components to this. We put focus and emphasis on depending on, on who we're working with and what their objective is, what their destination is. Wow. But there's so much there. And when it comes to like authors and authorship and writers, everything that you said there, for example, for instance, getting a sales coach and you're like, it's, it's more than just sales, it's marketing, it's branding, it's everything. And it's everything working together. That's something that, so many of us, when, when we write a book, whether we're doing fiction or nonfiction, when we're done, we think, ah, like we have accomplished our goal. We have crossed the finish line when really um, what we've done is we've just started the race because like you were just saying, everything we're saying, if we want to sell our books, if we want to 
make sure that, that we make a career of this and a business of this, we have to think of it as such as a business. So you're right. Bef- yeah. Before we hit record, you mentioned a story of having pre-selling 6,500 books before they came out. So to, we'll, we'll maybe omit the, the horrific events that, that happened after um, with, a, with a, a wrong file being uploaded, not on your part. But when it came to selling 6,500 books, pre-selling that, what were some of the things that you did beforehand to, to ramp up those sales? Uh, it's a really great question. And, uh, my first book, change your mind, change your results, which came out a number of years ago now. And, you know, I'll even share a little bit. And part of the reason I'll share this is because of how I've structured things in our companies. Um, you know, most people today in the traditional sense, when they, when they, they find a publisher and publish a book, the traditional style is that the publisher retains ownership of the intellectual property. Um, and so I have a good friend and now former client on the coaching side out of uh, Toronto. And he wrote a book and it was published by a traditional publisher. And uh, I was creating um, a, a course uh, for a client or working in conjunction with them to create a course around the contents of their book. And he phoned me one day. He says, I hear you're working with somebody. And, you know, there was some mutual acquaintances or friends involved that had shared this. And I said, yes. He says, well, I want to do that. And so, of course, you know, he called his his publisher and said, Hey, I want to create a course based on the contents of my book. And they said, Hey, no problem. You go ahead and create the course, but remember we own the intellectual property. So every course you sell, you have to pay us a royalty. And so one of the things that I looked at, you know, when I started helping these, the the experts out there is, um, you know, when you're going to write a book, make sure that you retain ownership of the intellectual property. Yes. Um, and it allows you to, we actually have a, a course that um, I've taught many, many times over the years. I haven't done it since um, since COVID hit in, in 2020, but, uh, and it's working with people to help them understand how a book can add a million dollars to their bottom line. And it's not because of sales in the book. Yeah, selling the book is going to make you a buck or two here or there, but literally that's about it. We live in a different world. Now, unless you maybe are Tony Robbins or... Um, you know, you're writing a different genre of book, um, you know, and you're, um, you're well known from a Hollywood standpoint, or, right. you know, that you're, you're going to have some challenges in hitting those kinds of numbers, um, where it becomes your sole source of income. So, you know, in my mind, I put that out the window right away. When I did the first book, um, there were some challenges. And, when we had sold 6,500 as a result of everything we did revolved around the book. If I was having a conversation, the, the book became part of that conversation from an intentional standpoint. If I was speaking from the front of the room, which I do and have done for years, a lot of, that book became part of it. And once my presentation was done, I had previous to getting on the stage, I had uh, had a conversation with the organizer, whoever it was, and we would passed out uh, a one-page order form where every single person, hey, listen, there are very few people today that can't afford 25 bucks or, or $29 or whatever, you know, your book, you know, cover price is. Um, and uh, we, you know, of course, we gave a discount for, you know, the pre-orders and let's get into things. Now, here's the, here's the interesting part. Uh, the publisher at the time, there were some challenges and the book was delayed by three years. Now, eventually got resolved. And, you know, you referenced, John, a few minutes ago, some of the horrific challenges where they, they, uploaded the wrong file and printed an unedited version and 10,000 copies had to be burned in in, yeah. uh, in Michigan. Um, but the sales of that book, it became central. Well, let's be clear. We did it. We run a business. We work with people. We coach people. We So that never changed. It just meant that um, we pre-sold 6,500 copies. Now, because of some of the challenges, I ended up having to refund the money on 6,500 copies of the book and eat the cost of the book and shipping when the book eventually did get did get uh, done and and we ended up with you know a pallet of half of books in our office um so you know there's there's a cautionary tale here of uh of what you decide to do when you write a book now let me be very clear about something you you need to have a book you need to write a book especially if you're in the the business world now you don't have to be in the expert space so to speak the unfortunate part about books um, uh, and about business is most people don't do what it takes to grow it. Right. 
right? right? Most people, and I say this with the utmost respect to every single person watching and listening, human nature is we're inherently lazy. And the reality behind that <laughs> blunt and direct statement is, is um, leveraging the book. I remember, um, you know, everyone told me, Sean, you should write a book, write a book, write a book. And eventually I did. And when it came out, I was, I was at an event down at the LAX Marriott and there was a banquet that was done the one night of this event. And there was about seven or 800 people there. And um, my first coach who was Bob Proctor and who wrote the forward to my first book uh, was on stage. And there was, it was a bunch of, you know, coaches and speakers. There was tons of us and there were very large round tables. There was about 10 people sitting at the table where I was. And, and towards the end of, you know, the event and dinner and people were sitting around having coffee and, and just, you know, ch chatting um the the topic of mindset was the topic of conversation at our table and i weighed in on something and the, and the gentleman sitting next to me who everyone knows he's a well-known speaker author um you know in, in north america and he said well what makes you the expert on mindset and my response was very simple i wrote the book change your mind change your results he goes oh okay now I want you to think about this for just a second, John. There was no further questioning. Yep. That, that one statement that I made that I'd written a book on this particular subject um, was good enough. So, you know, understand for those people who question, who say, you know, why me? Is, is anyone going to read my book? Should I? And I remember when I said I was going to write a book, you know, years ago now, and I had, I had past tense, a friend of mine, and I was pretty excited. Hey, I'm going to write a book. And he said, who the hell is going to read your book, Sean? What have you got to say? Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, I'm the, I'm that person, you know, if, if um, I don't want to hang out with detractors. So, you know, I, I'm not saying that I eliminate anyone from my life, but I certainly, uh, you know, uh, restrict the amount of time I invest with um, people that are, you know, in that mindset. And it's interesting, yeah. um, that book, that first book of mine has generated, We've I've sold, I've probably given away 25,000 copies and sold thousands and thousands more online through our own store online, you know, at, at my events, uh, you know, you, you name it. Uh, it's generated millions of dollars, right? That's, yeah. and, and I think a lot, not on the book, because of the book. And I think that's yes. the, the distinguishable difference. That's a, what you just said was great. Not be, not from sales, not because of the book. Um, but so what you mentioned too, like all, all your sales numbers and everything, but when it comes to that, like productivity and the mindset, like you were saying, the mindset of an author. So some of the numbers and the sales numbers that you're throwing out are fantastic, right? So the average book now sells a thousand copies over its lifetime, 200 copies in the first year. So when it comes to, like having the having a proper mindset to move forward with your your second book or even hearing that like if you're listening to this show right now and you're an aspiring author and you're like why am i going to waste my time if i'm only going to sell 200 copies in the first year when it comes to keeping productive right so you are the productivity coach how do you remain like optimistic and continue to move forward as an author who is hearing stats like these um, first of all, you, whoever you are watching and listening today, do not have to be a statistic. Let me be very clear. Uh, that's a decision you can make. So the decision is very simply, do I want to, uh, if you're going to be a statistic and sell 200 or a thousand or whatever those, you know, those numbers are, um, that's your decision too. Um, but if you're going to do that, maybe writing a book isn't for you. Um, a book is, um, I'm going to share a story. When the first book came out, um, we were, I was doing, I did two media tours with the book and I hired a publicist and, um, you know, United States, Canada, some in Europe, but predominantly here in, on this continent. And um, I did a ton of interviews and uh, I got a unsolicited Facebook message from a 16 year old young lady in the UK. And I have no idea who she is. We've never, ever connected or chatted more than one unsolicited Facebook message. And she, it, the message very simply said, Dear Mr. Shuchuk, thank you for writing this book. I purchased it. I read it. And it changed my life. Um, and that's in, in part, like if yeah. if that book did nothing else other than, than that impact, that one young lady 
it was all worthwhile. Now, don't get me the wrong way. Um, I wanted to have a lot more, and it has. Uh, you know, if if we go back to 2022, um, I know that there was about 25,000 of that book still sold. And I can attribute that I, I actually can, you know, put my finger on. Uh, it generated a million dollars in business for us. Um, that doesn't come because I sit on my backside and do nothing. Right. <laughs> um, you know, that book cover is is uh, still out there everywhere. It's still promoted, whether it's, you know, on shows like this, whether it's I'm on stage and it's on a screen behind me. Um, you know, it's um, and we'll this year, there's another book coming out. I'm about 98 percent done that manuscript. There'll be another one next year. I'm about 95 percent done that manuscript. Um, so, you know, and then there'll be this, the, 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 the second one that came out last year, the daily, Mo daily motivation, that's, that's volume one. Um, there's one page for every day of the year. Um, there'll be another volume that comes out at some point in time in the next, I don't know, 24 to 36 months. Um, the idea behind a book needs to, uh, very simply be a decision you make and say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do whatever it takes to make it happen. Um, are you going to have down days? Oh my goodness, yes. Oh yeah. Are you going to want and wish and desire that things are going to be different? There's only one way to make things different. And it's about you pulling yourself. I know this sounds very cliche. It's about you pulling yourself up by your bootstrap and saying, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make it happen. I do only so let's talk about this for a second. Um, we coach a lot of people, we've coached a lot of people. Um, I, I'm at a point in time in my life where I only take on five one-on-one clients at any given time. It's a big investment of time, energy, effort, and money. Um, and one of the things we talk about is the everything in your life is predicated on the decisions you make, everything. And your decision is going to determine the, out the outcome, whether it's on a book, um, whether it's in your life, in your marriage, in your relationships. Um, and, and if you're going to succeed, the book is one of those entry points to develop something that generates business. And that is strong, powerful and high trust relationships. Um, I have people that come up to me on a daily basis when I'm speaking, when I'm at events, when I'm traveling. And, uh, you know, by the way, one of the weirdest experiences you, you, you'll ever have if you ever decide to pursue something like I have is, you know, walking through an airport or being at an event and having people or individual walk up to you and say, you're Sean, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah, I don't I don't have a name tag on. I'm like, no, no, I read your book. Um, you know, that that's, that's an interesting experience the first few times it happens. Um, but um getting to a place where you make the decision that changes everything and it's tough and it's hard and you know one of my mentors and a very well-known individual he's the president of high point university uh in north carolina it's nito dr nito cobain and you know one of the things he says and he repeats this and it's he's right is most people remain the same until the pain of remaining the same is greater than the pain of change and what I have found is the only people that really relish change are babies in wet diapers. The rest of us, not so much. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah, that's a, a very good point to make. And going back to that, that like just the, the unsolicited message on Facebook, the one person that reaches out. So you mentioned before also that like one person can be your worst critic and can steer you away from writing the book altogether. And for, for most people too, that's, it's themselves. So like what, what you see is that people come to you with a book idea and they're like, you know, I have this great idea, but I'm not established enough. I'm not credible enough. Like who are these people? Why would anyone want to read my book when what they don't realize is that they could be 10 years into their career, even five years into their career. And there's someone who's five or 10 years behind them who needs answers and they don't want to wait for another 10 or 15 years for you to hit the pinnacle of your career to write your book. They need to know the advice now. Listen, I'm a farm kid. I was a farm kid. I, I'm a simple guy. Um, and when I finished and graduated high school and, you know, I thought I had life by the tail, I moved to the big city. And one of the things I vowed is that I would never become an entrepreneur. I watched my dad work hard and struggle and work 18 hours a day. And I, I never, uh, you know, and I actually was unhappy. I didn't have the traditional childhood that most of my friends had that I went to school with, you know, their dads went to work at eight and came home at five and they got to hang out with them and spend weekends. I didn't get this. 
And of course, now look at me, you know, I'm 44, we just started the 44th company. And, and um, that, you know, there's, you know, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I can uh, tell. <laughs> the idea behind all of this is um, the only thing that is holding you back, anyone listening or watching today down the road, if you're watching this years from now, um, the only thing holding you back is you. And it's a decision you make. Now, I'm going to share one more story, if I can be so bold, John. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing uh, one of the media tours for the first book, and I was on a talk show, radio talk show uh, in the state of Florida. Um, the whole entire state, it's a one-hour show. There's millions of people listening to this interview. And I'm coming to them. I didn't travel there. We're you know, doing this by phone. And um, I, the show starts, and I'm on. The guy is interviewing me. We're having a relatively good conversation. And uh, we come back from the half hour break and there's a different guy on the other end. He's like, hi, Sean, my name is whatever it was. And um, you don't know me, I'm I'm the co-host. I didn't even know the show had a co-host. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so one of the things I'd said in the first half hour of the show was, and this is keep in mind, this is a time just after the 08 crash, there are lots of people struggling. And I said, listen, um, there is always an opportunity. I don't care where you come from, what your background is. Uh, you know, I don't care what city you come from, what inner city you come from, who your parents are, who you have or don't have in your life, what your education level is, what color your skin is. None of this is relevant. There is an opportunity, but you have to actually go look for it, find it and embrace it. And unless you do that, you're never going to be able to take advantage of the benefits and I, this went on for like probably five minutes, this line of conversation. And so this parent co-host gets on and he says, um, and, and this is part of, of being able to think fast in your feet, especially in the business realm. This co-host says to me, he says, listen, Mr. Shuchuk, he says, you sound a lot like um, this is, you know, you're leaning to the left and a Democrat. And I said, oh, okay, like, give me an idea. He says, well, he says, you're politicizing uh, the fact that, you know, there's something for everyone and that's not the way the world works. And and I stopped him. And, and I'm not usually that guy to, you know, to, to step on someone's toes. But um, I was I was a little bit outraged. I won't say a little bit. I was I was very upset that he tried to do this. And I said, you know, I said there are millions of people, hundreds of millions of people today who are suffering and you are politicizing something that they could actually listen to, engage with, take advantage of. I said, you should be ashamed of yourself. You shouldn't be even on the air if you don't have the interest of people in this country who are suffering today because of something they didn't do. This is not about politics. This is not about who the president is in the White House at the time. This is not about your belief system of which side of the line you like to be on. Yeah. This is about every individual. And he shut up. He didn't say a word. And the the, co the host came back on. We finished the show at the top of the hour. And they go to commercial. And this co-host, of course, I'm still on the phone. No one, you know, the on-air can't hear me or him. And he says, Mr. Shuchuk, he says, I have never been chastised on air before uh, without someone swearing at me. Um, and I did. I, I you know, and I, I re-listened to the show. And I, I was, it was just a response and a, maybe even reaction. I eviscerated the poor guy. But the reality is every single person today listening to even this conversation, there is an opportunity and a book and your mindset and all of these different components. And that's why we talk about the holistic approach. Yep. There is nothing that stops you from doing whatever it is you want to do. And you have what it takes. It comes down to a decision. And if you don't, go get a coach. Phone me and say, hey, Sean, I have a question for you and I'll take your call. There is a difference between saying, you know, I have two kids. I'm blessed to have two two young boys, one who's almost 12 and one who's six. And my little guy, um, a couple of years ago, ended up breaking his leg snow, snow skiing. And so ever since that happened, it's only been the last month or so, he's actually started to get past it. But he would say, Dad, I can't. Dad, I can't. And I said, I, I want you to stop using the, that, that term. And I want you to take the apostrophe and the T off, right? And so I showed him what it looked like because he's, you know, he's six. And I showed him what can't look like with the, you know, the contraction. And, and, uh, and he said, okay. And so, you know, yesterday we were doing some, he's like, dad. And I'm like, what are you going to say? He goes, I can. <laughs> um, right. And it changes. He was yeah. having a problem skiing. And so I sat down and we talked about how this impacts everything. Um, and it's springtime. So last weekend was our last weekend on snow. And I took him out two days, both days. And I said, it's the end of the year. 
you need to actually, you've been skiing for four years. Yeah, well, there was something that happened, but it's passed. You're good. You're healthy. There's no issues. I want you to show dad how you're going to embrace what you know, your knowledge. And I want you to know that you can and believe that you can. And he did. And we went to the top of the mountain. We were skiing. You know, I don't know much you know about snow skiing, but we were skiing blue runs. And we got back at the vehicle after and he phoned my wife. He's like, mom, he says, you're never going to believe this. Dad shared a secret with me. And now I know how to ski like a pro. <laughs> and it wasn't was, a secret. It yeah. was the belief system. It was a mindset thing. So you are, you're the productivity coach, but I feel like after everything you said, you could also be the positivity coach. So <laughs> we, um, I, we so much appreciate you being here. There's so much insight. You and I, we, we work with books. We could talk about books for hours, I'm sure. But the, the fact that everything you brought to this show is everything that I guess both of us have been trying to get out to the people that we work with, whether it's coaching or, um, or, you know, publishing and book writing, but that what putting your words into a book can do for you and can do for your career. We're in this age where like the solopreneur is just on the rise um, and just spreading your message through a book can just help you. It doesn't have to be some kind of explosive growth. It can start slow and you can work up from there, but just getting your information in a book, Sean, like the example you said, sitting at a table saying, I wrote the book about it can just no, no further questions asked. Um, it can really help. So we appreciate all the positivity that you've brought to this episode about productivity. Um, and we want to thank you, but one last question is where can people where can listeners find you? Where can they follow you? Uh, well, social media anywhere. And then they can go to our website at changeyourresults.com. And if they want to get a copy of the book or the journals or any of the stuff that we've worked on, uh, did a movie as well, all again around coaching uh, called Game Changer, you can go to uh, highproductivitystore.com and uh, you can grab a copy and uh, our team will ship it out to you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. We'll put that for the listeners. We'll put that in the show description. Sean, thank you again for being here. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.